You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Past episodes of the Authentic Business Adventures program can be found in the podcast link at drawincustomers.com. We are locally underwritten by the Bank of Sun Prairie. My name is James Kademan, entrepreneur, author, speaker, and helpful coach to small business owners across the country. Today, we're welcoming slash preparing to learn from Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Hopefully, I didn't butcher that name. <laughs> author of, or author, I should say, you have tons of books out, and you also help authors, as well as the founder of Stark Publishing. So, Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And, and you did not butcher the name. You got it perfectly. So, thanks nice. so much. Oof. Appreciate it. That must, is that French? It is a French name. Yeah. Right. Uh, and and, and uh, it's probably one of the one of the tips I would give uh, for, for writers or business people. So people walk into a bookstore typically, or they're looking on Amazon or however they're finding a book. You want them to be able to spell or pronounce your last name. Mm -hmm. Now, given that Lefebvre, uh, you've got all these consonants that you have to ignore. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's not an easy one. And it has never been an easy name. So I, uh, my middle name is uh, Leslie. And, uh, and I've always, uh, you know, had the three names. So when I was younger, I was reading uh, Piers Anthony, who is a fantasy writer. Mm -hmm. And I learned that he actually had a really long last name. It was Piers Anthony, Jacob Dillingham, something. It was this really long name with like 5,000 letters in it. Nice. And he wrote under his first and middle name. And, and I, when I started to write, and I started when I was 15, I adopted the pseudonym Mark Leslie because I thought, great, middle of the alphabet. It's an L just like my real last name. It is my name, but it's also a pseudonym. It's easy to pronounce. It's nice and short. Mm -hmm. And so for the majority of the books that I've published, uh, probably 90% of the books I've published, I've been using Mark Leslie. Nice. Because okay. most people, whether they say Leslie or Leslie, really, you kind of know how to spell it. So you walk into a bookstore, you go to Amazon, you type it in, you got it. So yeah. uh, it, it's a little bit easier for everyone. So that was a very rudimentary business decision I made when I was about 15. When you're 15, that's pretty smart to have the insight like that. Uh, because I was reading so much, right? So again, I read the, the author's notes in Piers Anthony, and I was a big fan. And, and I had started, I got my first rejection at the age of 15, when I started sending my manuscript, sending my stories out, trying to get published. Wow. So many, many years of rejection, probably. Um, yeah, well, I, I was rejected uh, socially, uh, you know, I asked, ask, hey, would you go to the dance with me? No, you're ugly. <laughs> right? And you have zits on your face or whatever. But, <laughs> right. uh, I was sending out the reject, you know, stories for contests and try to get in magazines and stuff. And I would get my rejections. Now I started, it was probably, uh, so when I was 15, I'm trying to think, uh, I think my first story was published when I was 19. Wow. So four years of rejections. Uh, and then I got uh, my first acceptance. So um, I think it was my final year of university in 1992. Nice. Uh, when my very first short story appeared in print, uh, finally, because I got accepted and then it got published a year later. All right. I think I got $5 and a contributor's copy of the magazine. So I was in heaven because after years of wanting to be published, right. I finally, uh, some small press magazine called Chapter One, which was only looked at uh, unpublished authors. So it was, uh, you know, I had more of a chance of getting yeah. in. Uh, they took pity on me. They, I bought my story and, uh, and, and that was the first sale. Uh, so I graduated from university. I started working part-time in a bookstore and my first story appeared in print. I was on my oh. way, baby. Two signatures on that check, right? Five dollars. <laughs> That's awesome. So when you, I'm just trying to wrap my head around you submitting stuff when you're 15, yeah. I wouldn't even know where to begin. And you're talking, at that point, you're talking early 90s, late 80s. Internet's not really a thing, certainly no. not as far as books are concerned. So how did you know where to send the manuscripts and stuff like that? So I grew up in mid-northern Ontario in Canada, uh, which is basically um, uh, four hours drive north of Toronto, Ontario, if, if people are familiar with that. We didn't have a bookstore. The, the nearest bookstore was a, at the city, a big city of Sudbury, Ontario, an hour, uh, an hour away. And so we had the library and we did have magazines. So we had like a, a mini mart, a, a corner store uh, where you can pick up magazines. So Writer's Digest magazine 
Mm-hmm. I, I picked it up every month and I read it cover to cover. Wow. And I would go to the library and I would get a writer's market. And then sometimes occasionally I would go and get, it, we would go into Sudbury into the big city and be like, mom, can I have the writer's market? <laughs> but it's $15, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I would get the writer's market and I would look up markets and, and it would be listed uh, where the market was, where you would submit it, what the editor's name was, what they were looking for, um, you know, genres, length, and what they paid. And I went in and I highlighted things and I was like, okay, I've got this horror story or I've got this humor story or I've got this, you know, action adventure. And you'd send them off. And what you had to do, so this is pre-internet again, is you had to, uh, I was on typewriter, so you would type type up. I didn't, didn't even have access to a photocopier in the early days. There was, I think the church, uh, my church had a photocopier. It was the only place in town that had a photocopier. <laughs> we didn't, we had mimeograph machines in the high school or in the, you know what I mean? So the oh, photocopies yeah. were few and far in between back then. You'd send it off in a self, with a self-addressed stamped envelope. So you would mail your manuscript off to the editor. You would have a little uh, number 10 envelope. And it was called an SASE, self-addressed stamped envelope. And you put, you put, uh, and, and again, because I'm in Canada and most of the markets I would submit to are in the States, I couldn't just put a Canadian stamp on it. I had to get an international reply coupon, which cost about $1.25, wow. which meant the editor could then take the IRC <coughs> to their local post office and they would give them a stamp for it. <laughs> so, it was, so it was still extra work. Um, I ended up eventually uh, ordering stamps from the States so that it was easier for them to reject me because they could just... <laughs> What they would do is they take the first page of your manuscript, right? And then they would write on it like no or whatever, or they'd throw in a little checkbox. We're not accepting this for whatever. They'd fold it up and, and, and you'd get that letter back. So when I checked the mailbox, and this was like six to nine months while you were waiting to hear back. Mm-hmm. If the envelope was thick, it usually included a contract and an offer that they wanted the story. All right. If it was thin, it was probably a rejection slip with the first page of your manuscript. Sometimes, right. if you were lucky, the editor would make a note. You know, really like the story, but uh, I didn't believe the ending or the one character was stale or whatever they would just, whatever note they took, I took it very seriously because they took the time to let me know that. And I actually ended up sometimes rewriting the story because an editor made a comment and then I would go back and tweak what they said and send it to another editor and then sell it. So again, I would take rejections and go, you know, I asked Sally to the dance and Sally said, no, you're too tall. So the next girl asked the dance, I crouch a little bit and I say, Hey, (laughs) like, it's that, is that sort of, you you kind of adjust. Right. But yeah, this was, um, this is pre-internet. So uh, (laughs) I got a lot of paper rejections in the mail. Funny. So when you're doing this, you're 15 years old, 16, 17, were your parents like, this is normal. This is just what 15 year olds do. Well, I wanted to be a stuntman too, uh, because I was a big fan of the fall guy with Lee. Mayer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's like, no, I was afraid of heights and stuff. So I, so the one thing that was kind of funny is I knew uh, from when I was really young, uh, apart from wanting to be a fireman and a police officer and a stuntman and all the cool things that kids want to be an astronaut. I I'd said, uh, I want to be a writer. I, w- I, w- I knew I wanted to be a storyteller. I wanted that to be, that was just something I wanted to do. And, and my, my parents are very pragmatic, uh, lovely, wonderful uh, folks. But my mom would say, well, you better get a good job then, son. And <laughs> so that was the advice. I remember watching, you know, because we had like the one TV and there was only one channel back then. And we'd be watching a show together as a family. And I remember anytime there was a writer who was part of the show, um, I, I remember this one writer and he was like carrying, carrying groceries up and all he had was, um, you know, a box of uh, we craft dinner, which is a Canadian macaroni and cheese thing mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. Um, spam. And she says, see, he's a writer. He can't afford to eat anything else. So <laughs> if, you, if you're going to become a writer, you better get a good job. And so funny. You're like, come on. I've seen Angela Lansbury in murder. She wrote, she's doing all right. Well, there are there are there are the writers that that do really really well, but um, mo- you know, for the most part, it's 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 not an easy. It's not. It's like if you want to actually make money, guaranteed make money. Do you want fries with that? Guaranteed make money, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I go, right. I punch a clock, I I work my shift, and I get paid consistently. Mm-hmm. With writing, you're taking a chance. So totally, um, I did end up going 
into the book industry. When I was in, I got a degree in English language and literature, which, you know, I loved reading and I, and I ended up, uh, I was working part-time at a theater when I was in university. So I was a theater tech doing lighting design and sound. Cause I was, I, I love that sort of thing. But then a um, friend of mine was working at uh, a bookstore, uh, Kohl's, which was a chain uh, in Canada, in Ottawa, where, where I went to school. And they were looking for part-time seasonal help. And, I, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, being around books, you know, read all day. It sounds like my cup of tea. So I started working as a part-time bookseller for Christmas help. Mm -hmm. I got bit by the book bub bug. I fell in love with book selling. And I've been in the book industry ever since. So I thought, okay, this is great. I'm going to, I had a career working in bookstores and, you know, eventually uh, working my way up to management. And, and then I worked at head office for Chapters Indigo, which is Canada's uh, version of Barnes and Noble, basically. Yeah. And uh, doing all kinds of stuff that way. And I thought I love, what I loved about it is all along the way is my parents advised me, you're going to write because that's what you're passionate about doing, but make sure you have a good job. But my good job was in an area I was very passionate about. So All right. the downside to that, James, the downside to that is because I loved my job so much, I didn't take my breaks. I didn't write on my breaks. I probably would have gotten more writing done. Oh, I sure. probably would have worked less hours. Because mm -hmm. when I became a manager, it was 60, 80 hours. And because it was my store and I, and I cared for it and instead of going home and writing. So, I mean, if anything, I mean, what a, what a, wow, wow, poor me, but what a problem to have that you love your job, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. That's interesting. So when you, the stuff that you did write, or when you first started out, that was mostly horror. And what were you writing in the beginning? Uh, yeah, I, I always write, I always wrote scary stories. So okay. uh, ironically, the first story I had published was uh, a young adult humor story. Now, I remember because I wrote it for a grade 13 um, uh, writing assignment and it was a correspondence course because they, our high school was so small we didn't even have we had like just one English class that was it and I wanted to take creative writing but we didn't offer it because our school wasn't big enough like there, right. no students wanted it but me so I took a correspondence course to take a second credit in English for creative writing and my teacher was in Toronto and we were mailing things back and forth it was great wow but, she read the story that I wrote for one of the assignments and she said, well, I've never seen the movie because this will tell you when, when this was, I've never seen the movie Ferris Bueller's day off, but this story reminds me of what that would be like. Nice. A humorous story. So my very Humor. first story was YA humor. And because the teacher was like, wow, she's comparing it to, she's never seen it, but she's comparing it to what she's heard about Ferris Bueller's day off. That's the first story I sold. All right. uh, the second story I sold, <clears throat> was horror and it was um it was called phantom itch and it was about the, the whole idea that you've heard of the phantom itch right well what if is if, if a soldier for example loses a, a limb mm -hmm. uh they maybe no longer have their arm or their leg or whatever oh, they can sure. feel an itch yeah. on the phantom like the they can feel a phantom itch on mm -hmm. on the arm, arm that doesn't exist and so i speculated what if that arm is in another world still like simultaneous and what if somebody died in the accident where you lost your arm and you could feel them and touch them and hold their hand oh weird so it was just this really <laughs> and sure. that story received honorable mention in uh the year's best fantasy and horror so wow yeah because i couldn't I, I guess i i've always been afraid of the monster under my bed so i always uh most of the stories that i write usually involve something eerie or creepy or what if or maybe you think of the twilight zone all right sure weird, weird stuff that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. <laughs> uh most of my writing is usually usually fall in, into that uh, sort of category all right i can see i remember the first time i met you and i see all the skulls and i'm like what does this guy like harleys or what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> they're all fake they're not the skulls of my enemies they are right. uh, you know, ceramic <laughs> and stuff but uh sure. yeah because i don't know what it was i started uh, when i when i launched my first book in 2004 uh which i did self-publish uh i ended up because it was a collection of twilight zone-ish horror stories mm -hmm. i ended up uh, at the book event I, I think it was at some craft fair and i saw this really cool ceramic skull that was a candle. Uh, you put a little candle in it and it, you know, a glow. Nice. And I, and I thought, well, because I'm doing scary stories, I should have like a, you know, a tablecloth with spider web on it and stuff. 
and I'll, and I'll put the skull beside me. I call them Yorick from Hamlet. That's the, the skull that Hamlet's holding up. Alas, poor Yorick, I knew him. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I brought Yorick. Uh, and then just over time, people would buy me skulls uh, or I would see skulls and, and, and you know, the people would gift them to me. I actually have, you can see some behind me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's probably another half dozen on the other side of the room. Wow. And we have uh, three life-size skeletons, uh, Barnaby, who has accompanied me to uh, events. And, and this is this is a business lesson. Mm -hmm. I always talk to authors about their brand, right? The looking professional and, and stuff like that. So even though I write horror, uh, you know, I'll, I'll wear a sports coat, uh, maybe black, uh, usually because it's scary stuff. Sometimes it'd be a sports coat with a skull shirt because nice. uh, and i'll take barnaby with me now i even have uh, you know tombstones and i i have a setup so when you see me in at a, at a bookstore at the front of the store or whatever and you're walking in the mall and you see this guy sitting with a skeleton you know one of two things you're going to either run in the opposite direction because this is a crazy man and please don't make co eye contact with him mm -hmm. <laughs> or you think okay he's writing macabre stuff he's writing either true crime or mystery or thrillers or or horror or whatever and so it really helps me immediately isolate who my target readers are. Yeah. Who avoid me? Well, not my cup of tea. They're not okay. But the people who come running over and go, oh my God, I love your skulls. Where'd you get them? They may be ideal audience. Totally. That's your audience. The other thing that's really cool is people don't want to be sold to, right? Mm -hmm. And so when they see when you see someone, you're like, okay, don't make eye contact with the author. He might try and sell us his book but they're interested in the book. So I do two things. I usually work out with the bookstore and I ask them to make a pile of my books about 10, 20 feet away from me. Mm. And then my books are there visible with the signs. I have the banner and everything and a skeleton. Uh, if they're cautious about approaching me because they don't want to be sold to, because I'm, I'm not a, a pushy sales guy. I don't like that, but right. I know how people react. They want to know what I'm doing, but they don't want to come talk to me in case I try to sell them stuff because they don't want to be sold to. So they see me, then they see my books over there, far away from me. They go check them out completely uh, relaxed. No, right, no sure. anxiety. No and direct then contact. If they, if they like what they see, then they come rushing over and uh, ask me to, uh, to sign the book or, or, mm -hmm. or talk about the book. Now the skeleton is there as an icebreaker right guess what people say when i'm sitting there with a skeleton what's his name no well, something like that or if they're <laughs> if they're like a dad joke kind of person they oh, might oh that guy real yeah he <laughs> hey real? looks like you've been sitting there for a long time or hey <laughs> looks like your buddy could use a sandwich right whatever he's waiting for a publisher yeah exactly and so it's an icebreaker for people to joke around mm -hmm. and we have something fun to talk to uh, I often will put a t-shirt with the book that I'm selling with Barnaby. Sometimes I'll put Barnaby, like uh, one time I was at a mall and there was like a bench just across, like, out, like 10 feet out in, from the bookstore. I just sat Barnaby there with my shirt and people would come by and they would sit down beside him and take selfies and, Funny. and uh, free advertising. And totally. then they would go, Oh my God, that must be that guy's right. And so they, they've played with it. They've had a good time. Reciprocity theory Totally. I've given them something fun to do. They come over and chat with me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, I there's, there's uh, quite a bit of strategic fun in there. That is, I have to, I can honestly say, I've talked to a lot of authors. You are the first one that I've ever talked to that was that aware of what it takes to actually sell. Yeah. Some of them are just like pile of books here, table here, pen here, click, click. Let's sign these away. <laughs> Where's the line? Yeah, where, where are all my people? Yeah, but where you set it up, you make a show out of it. It's an entertainment, which is exactly what books are. That's genius. I love that. Well, I think it comes from uh, book selling, right? Having worked in bookstores for all those years, mm -hmm. I've, I've seen authors sit there. And, and here's here are the three most common things that you get asked as an author. Uh, where's the bathroom? Um, where's this title that's a current bestseller, whatever it is? And, and usually where's this section of the store? So here's what I do when I get to a bookstore I've never been to before. Mm -hmm. I, fig I find out where the closest bathrooms are in the mall. I find out where the bestseller uh, section is. And if I'm not familiar with the, what the bestselling books are, I go take a look at them. Now I can take a picture on my phone so I can familiarize myself with them. Mm -hmm. So if somebody asks me something, 
because they think I work in the store. Right. Uh, or, or, and I just familiarize myself with, you know, all the different like, the sports sections over here and, and whatever. And then that way, if they ask a question, I can actually try to help them. Mm -hmm. And, um, and oftentimes then later they'll feel bad. Then they, they cause they, they come in, they, they, they don't know. They just walk and I work customer service for, for decades. Right. So I'm used to, to that. You, you just help them. That's what you're there for. Right. They come in, they're confused. They've never been to the stores. Like, oh, I need to get, you know, the new John Grisham book for my, for my dad for Father's Day or whatever. So they don't know. And then they ask a question. I'd like to have an answer for them so that mm -hmm. their first experience is a positive one with me, even if it has nothing to do with my book. Right. Other times I've had people come up and say, oh, what do you write? I was like, well, I write, you know, true ghost, I have some true ghost story books or oh, it's, it's Twilight Zone style fiction or whatever. And they go, oh, oh, wow. I was, well, I, I really like, um, I really like contemporary romance. In which case, I guess because I'm a bookseller, I go, well, then you need to read my friend Julie Strauss's book, Prosecco Heart. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. Contemporary romance, some com it's like a romantic comedy. And it's in the fiction section just under S. You'll find it there. It's amazing. I can't recommend it enough to you. Because if I try to push my book on them. Right not going to be a good experience for you Come on. They're going to hate it anyways I read some blood <laughs> yeah but then huh. what sometimes happens again this is this is reciprocity in business they go and it's like oh my god that that sounds like a great romance and they go pick up the romance or whatever that whatever i recommended and then they may think when they've had time to just like looking at my books over there they may think huh well my cousin ralph he loves horror and scary stuff. Maybe I'll see if I can get him to sign a copy for my cousin Ralph. Mm -hmm. So this, for me, it's always never about the hard sell. It's always about the soft sell. And it's always first, like you said, it's about let's entertain and give them some satisfaction first. Totally. And maybe it'll lead to a sell. Maybe it won't. But at the very least, I had a good time. Totally. That's the name of the game. Yeah. I feel like you're talking about something like when I show up at a Target with a tucked in shirt with a collar, I can almost guarantee that I'm going to be asked where something is. Yeah. Well, where's the, is men's that rare? <laughs> because you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I used to show up, I used to work in a movie theater for way too long when I was in college and you show up with the whole garb, even the bow tie. <laughs> like, yeah. Do target people wear bow ties? What's going on here? <laughs> but eventually you're just like, yeah, it's down that aisle, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Let me take you there. Interesting. So let's talk about the self-publishing thing. You self-published your first book. Yeah. And this, when was your, when was your first book published? What year? 2004. So that was right. the dark ages, right? That was a long Yeah. Time. I was trying to think like ago, 2004, right? where was Amazon at that time? Where was even printing? Like, I mean, like at home printing was probably kind of a thing. It was, uh, so print on demand was relatively new. Mm -hmm. And I had, I gotten to a point where I had started to, you know, I said $5 and a contributor's copy. And so, and then and it went up to $25 as, as I got to bigger and bigger markets where I actually got pro rates is six cents a word for fiction or was nice. back in the day. So I was getting to a point where I was, I, I had, you know, dozens of stories sold to different magazines, but I worked in bookstores and the most frustrating thing that happened was people would say, so you're a writer. And I would go, yeah, I'm a writer. And they'd say, well, where can I find your stuff? And I would go, well, as we stand in, in a bookstore, get in your car and drive about three hours south across the border in Niagara Falls, go into New York State. Uh, there's an, it's another 45 minute drive and you'll get to a small town, uh, Black River, New York. And on the bookstore, uh, on the shelf in, in, in the store there, there's a rack where you'll find a magazine. Oh, oh, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's May 31st. You got to get there before the end of the month because they're going to be pulling it off the shelf. <laughs> Right. So it was, that was, that was like, well, I'm in print, but this is magazine circulation, a few thousand. It's only distributed in, in one state or whatever, or it's regional. You could never find my stuff. Right. So I had uh, all these stories and they had already been selected by editors, already been edited, but I got the rights back. Right. So after they'd been in print, you know, after they've been, after a year or six months or a year or two years, you have reprint rights. You can resell them. And I had done that with some stories. Mm -hmm. uh, which I always say to writers, reduce, uh, re recycle, because you can make money off the same property repeatedly. Mm -hmm. But then I, uh, I learned about print on demand uh, through Ingram. Uh, it was Lightning Source, which was the, the, the company that uh, the big publishers use. Mm -hmm. 
and you had to actually know how to format a book, which I taught myself how to do with Adobe and stuff like that. No, it's and I took in my design. stories. All right. Uh, One hand screaming was the name of the book. Uh, just the, the thought of it. Uh, and, and my and my best friend Steve uh, designed the cover for me. He was a graphic designer, <laughs> and so I put this book together, and it was ninety percent reprints and two or three new stories. Put it together made it uh, available through Ingram. And I also made it fully returnable because I knew the business of publishing. So I could actually call a bookstore up and say, hey, I'm going to be in Pittsburgh, uh, you know, for business or whatever next uh, week. I noticed you're a downtown store. I'd love to come in at lunchtime because that's usually when their uh, traffic would be busy. I'd love to come in and do some signings for you. You can order my book. Here's the ISBN. It's available from Ingram. It's fully returnable. So I knew they wouldn't be stuck with it. So I understood the business. And I, I self-published back in the day, and this was self-publishing was a dirty word back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had friends who were traditionally published writers. So I got to know people who were like making full-time writing uh, income as, as writers. And I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to self-publish. I'm going to put this book together. And they're like, oh, no, 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 don't self-publish. It's the best way to kill your career. No one will take you seriously. They still gave me blurbs. I asked them for blurbs uh, and mm -hmm. they still were kind enough to give me blurbs, but they're like, Mark, don't do it. Don't do it. No one like, cause this was, it was a dirty word. It was like, you know, picking your nose. People would pick their nose, but they wouldn't talk about picking their nose. So you'd never admit to self-publishing, <laughs> right? That kind of thing. So I created a company name that I registered called Stark Publishing. Now the friend of mine who designed the book cover for me, Steve, we were best friends our entire lives. When we were kids, we dreamed about having a company called Stark, um, Stark Entertainment. Nice. And, and we were going to do all comic books. We were going to do all, all the things that kids want to do. When we were in college, we had a DJ company and we had business cards printed up and, and, and it was called Stark Entertainment. And so I called Steve up to ask if he would do the cover for me. And I said, hey, listen, I, I need to register a business name. I'd love to register Stark Publishing. Are you okay if I use our name? So he got like, he got ST, Steve, and I got Mark. So Stark was how oh, he nice. <laughs> designed the logo for me, which I still use to this day. And every single one of my self-published books has been under the Stark Publishing uh, banner and imprint. And it's also the, the name of my business. And since I left the corporate world, uh, then I, I went, you know, just a few years ago, went sort of full tilt. Stark Publishing is my... <laughs> is is what i publish under but it's also my business name as a consultant nice so how many books have you published um i have about 25 or 26 books so some maybe 10 of them or 12 of them are traditionally published where okay. publishers actually paid me money all right uh, which i like uh, mm -hmm. which is kind of nice uh, and then the rest of them are self-published. And, and then right. some of them are weird hybrid <laughs> combinations sure. of, you so know. So you didn't get branded and lose your legitimacy by self-publishing your first book? No, no, because I did it professionally, right? I didn't just, uh, and again, so the other thing too, so I hid behind the fact that it was self-published. I made it look like a real publisher. I had the little imprint and everything on it, and it looked like a real book. It was edited. And here's the, 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 the way I justified it. A lot of times it's like, well, I couldn't sell it to a publisher. It's no good. No one wants it. Well, most of the stories had already sold to a publisher. So for me, it, I had this feel like it had already had the stamp of approval from somebody. Even if they paid me five bucks or 200 bucks, whatever it was, they were willing to pay money. Mm -hmm. They usually edited the book, uh, the story. So it was all edited. Nice. And so, um, and when I... I think when I pitched my first book uh, to a traditional publisher, which was uh, 2011, was that when that was published? I think they looked at my history. I had self-published two books. Uh, I, did a, I did an anthology with 13 other authors, and I had some big name authors who agreed to write for me because I raised the money from a few businesses. to. Uh, it was being used to, to uh, advertise for their business. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the university bookstores that actually supported it. So I got $6,000 and I was able to use that to pay the authors. Wow. So I was able to get big name authors in the, and so when I pitched my first book to Dundurn, which is Canada's largest independent publisher, which was uh, haunted Hamilton, I, I pitched it telling them the market and said, okay, this is a book for people who love ghost stories. And it's for people who love the city of Hamilton. And it's for people who love Canadian history. Because in that Venn diagram of those three demographics is the target audience. Mm -hmm. And there has never been a book of ghost stories about Hamilton, but there's a ghost walk group in Hamilton that's very popular and they get an average of X amount of people per week. Therefore, 
there is a market for it. So I, my pitch was very marketing focused on you're going to sell this book. Yeah. And I think I'm pretty sure they looked at my previous books. They couldn't tell they were self-published and they probably thought, okay, dude's willing to, <laughs> to hit the street. Dude's willing to put his nose to the grindstone and he's actually willing and he understands how to sell books. And I, and I honestly believe that publishers do look at, at the marketability of, of an author and the book is like, is, is this a good book for this market? Will this sell? Uh, is there demand? Mm -hmm. Is the author going to hide at home and, and want everyone else to do the work? Or is this author going to get out there and hit the streets and right. help sell the book? And get I get out there, bring the skulls and the t-shirts and make it happen. Yeah. Like, okay. He's a little weird and his stuff, he's got the skulls, but if he's going to sell a book about ghost stories, I betcha, People are going to look, <laughs> they're going to look twice when they walk by him. Yeah. In the end, you're in the, I mean, that's a sales business, right? So if you look like just another dude, you're going to sell books like just another dude, which is not many. Yeah. But if you're putting on something where you stand out, you're peacocking a little bit, you can make stuff happen. People remember that. I uh, totally. think of uh, Neil Gaiman, uh, right? Very, very popular, famous author. Neil Gaiman never appears uh, not in black. That's part of part of his brand is he always wears black top huh. to bottom. All right. Top and, to bottom. Well, to, just to, like, just top to like complete, like black pants, black top, whether it's t -shirt, really, jacket. All right. he's just, and that's his brand. Kind of like Tom Wolf. Thomas Wolf uh, was always the white suit with the top hat. That was his look and feel like, so it's kind of like that look and feel that someone has. And so you see them and you go, ah, that's their brand. R Richie right. Rich, right? Always wore the exact same <laughs> coat and, right. and shorts and stuff like that, right? That's just part of the brand. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a friend of mine, Rob Sawyer, who's a, a Canadian science fiction uh, writer, he was in China with Neil at an event and it was a hot, hot summer day. And Rob's sitting there in shorts and t-shirt in the audience because uh, they're, they're like doing some, some event where the different writers are coming up on stage and saying things. And, and, and Neil's sitting beside Rob. And, and Neil, in the hottest day in the summer in China, he's wearing full black. And Rob's like, for God's sake, Neil, change your clothes. You, 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 you're going you're gonna to die. <laughs> he goes, I can't. I'm Neil Gaiman. <laughs> he was like, no. That <laughs> is awesome. No it's brand, right? Like people totally. expect to see something. And, and he was very committed because that's what the people who knew who he was, that's what they expected to see. And so he delivered that. And that's critical for writers. Mm -hmm. You need to deliver what you're supposed to deliver based on your brand. Right. Which is, I think is really a, a very important aspect that we often overlook. Oh, I bet most of the time. I can see from the authors that I've spoke to, brand is a four letter word. <laughs> people should just buy my stuff for the love of the art. Yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of like, eh, there's a lot of people with a lot of art. you got to stand <laughs> out somehow. Yeah. So just yeah. like any other product out there. So you also consult with authors and help them market and get their dream published, I suppose, if you, for lack yeah. of a better phrase. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. So because I've worked in the book industry since 1992, I did run. Uh, so some of the roles I've played is I was the president of the Canadian Bookseller Association for several years. I've been on the board of BookNet Canada, which is kind of like a Nielsen book scan. You know, the people who do the bestseller. Uh, well, Nielsen for ratings and stuff, but it's like a book, <laughs> book, book bestsellers and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked uh, as a manager of almost every kind of bookstore, uh, independent chain, big box store. I worked at head office. I managed the database for chapters Indigo like wow. taking all the data from the publishers and small publishers. Um, I was a, I was a, buy, a book bookstore buyer, local manager, uh, campus store as well. So I worked in practically every kind of bookstore imaginable. And uh, I did start the self-publishing platform at Kobo. So Kobo, uh, Rackets and Kobo is Canada's answer to Kindle. All right. An ebook company born, uh, born here in Canada and now international. And so I created their, their self-publishing platform, Kobo Writing Life, which is like Kindle Direct Publishing. Well, I didn't create it. Really smart developers created it, but Kobo hired me to come up with a solution to make it easier for self-published authors to publish direct. Wow. They hired me. They sat me in a chair, gave me a phone and a laptop and said, okay, figure out what we're going to do. And that was like the scariest and coolest thing in the world. Huh. Uh, 
to figure out how we were going to, were we going to build something? Were we going to buy something? Were we going to partner with someone? So it took me about six months of just learning the business, understanding, and then we built Kobo Writing Life. And uh, by the time I left Kobo, uh, one in every four books that sells on Kobo to this day, because I just heard a stat last week from someone who still works there. Mm -hmm. One in every four books that sells at Kobo comes from Kobo Writing Life. Wow. Yeah. So that was quite a success. So I, I, I got to a point where I didn't want to get promoted to like, you know, vice president or whatever, because I wanted to be in the weeds with the books. That's mm -hmm. where I love, <laughs> but there was nowhere else for me to go. So after uh, about six years, I got to a point where I'm like, okay, I've got a really good team in place. I hired really smart people. I'm kind of redundant. Uh -huh. uh, and I took my leave I left the company on good terms uh, and uh, decided I'm going to maybe start to write full time because I really have left my writing. Yeah, I was only doing it on the side as opposed mm -hmm. to full time, but I couldn't leave consulting because I was so passionate about helping authors. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, I started my podcast and I uh, started consulting part time and writing part time. Uh, and then after, after about a year, I started working for another company part-time as a consultant, mm -hmm. uh, draft to digital, which distributes uh, books to different retailers. Yeah. They do the same thing, it's free service. And, and I guess along the way, I probably would get more writing done if I didn't consult, mm -hmm. but there's nothing like helping a writer because there's so many scam artists and there's so many companies. And, and you know this yourself, when you went to do your book, I betcha there were places that said, Hey, give us $10,000 and we'll do this or give us. Oh my gosh. And they'll sell you marketing packages. You do not need. Yeah. And what's interesting is the, the emails, the phone calls, all that kind of stuff that I would receive. I was blind. I had no idea. And I thought I got to market this book. How's that going to happen? And so those guys come out, I'm hungry for marketing. And they're like, look, man, we got Thanksgiving feast of marketing. <laughs> and so I'm like, well, that sounds good. I remember I paid, I don't know, I paid one of those clowns maybe 700 bucks, promises of moonbeams and rainbows. And I believe that all I got from that was a bad story because I never saw, like they said, you're going to be in all these magazines yeah. and blah, 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 blah. They don't exist. Like I was sucker of sucker, sucker of suckers, I should say. And then I got an email, another one from them pitching again when I published another book. And I'm like, hey, uh, I never saw anything from the other one. And they're like, oh, let me get back to you. And I'm still they waiting for that reply. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh my God, I was, I was chopped liver in a sea full of sharks. And I imagine just about every author probably feels that same way. Oh, oh I guarantee it. And to be quite honest, $700, you, you got away with uh, nothing. Like that, mm -hmm. that was, there are authors who, who pay $1,500, $5,000, and promises of the moon mm -hmm. and all that's going to happen is the company that promised you this stuff is going to have a pile of cash. That is the one guarantee. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do is I do have a free 20 minute consultation uh, op opportunity. Uh, so authors can just book a time, pick a time in my calendar and I'll talk to them for 20 minutes because if I can save them the heartache just by saying, okay, uh, you know, for any writers listening, if just Google the term writer beware is a website called writer beware, mm -hmm. and any company, anyone, me included that you've ever worried about working with in the publishing industry, go and search their name in writer beware. Cause if somebody had a bad experience with them, I guarantee you they'll be listed on writer beware. Nice. Um, and that's the one thing, but, but again, uh, not a lot of writers know this, but oftentimes I'll, I'll, I'll work with them and say, well, it doesn't sound like, I know they've promised you that they're going to get you this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. but let's look at the reality here. <laughs> like I'm not, not trying to be mean. And that's why my, my, ref, my, my podcast is called stark reflections because I want to take a very optimistic yet honest look. And what I don't want to tell people. And, and one of the things that bothers me even about the self publishing industry is there's people like, hey, if you self-publish, you can make six and seven figures a year. Well, you know what, James? I know hundreds of authors, hundreds of authors that are making six and seven figures a year self-publishing. Mm -hmm. But I know that there's hundreds of thousands of authors that aren't. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, I'm the not going to say, is... hey, James, you can be Stephen King or J.K. Rowling. No, uh, that's the 1%. 
it's possible. Mm -hmm. But most authors in self-publishing are probably going to make a little bit more money than they would make if they were traditionally published. Mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, or in my case, because I do both, I make twice as much money as I would normally make because I have some traditionally published books that sell through bookstores uh, mm -hmm. in print most often. Mm -hmm. And then the ones that I sell more of, uh, uh, e-books, um, in, in, uh, and I make way more margin on those anyways. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and so like, because yeah, my publishers don't know how to sell ebooks. So they sell print books really, really well. I can sell print books, but not the same volume as them because I don't have books stored. To, like I can't actually be on, uh, my publisher's gotten my books in Costco and Walmart and the major. Wow. Chain. All right. That's cool. I, yeah. I couldn't do that as much as I know about the industry because I need, I would need to print 20,000 copies mm -hmm. and then I would need to warehouse them somewhere. And then I would have to get them from the warehouse to Costco. Well, I can't do that. My, my self-published stuff's print on demand. Or mm -hmm. if I use a local printer, maybe I'm making a hundred copies to sell at a local comic con or something. Right. right? I'm not, I'm not going to be sitting on a, uh, 10,000 copies or, or, or whatever. So I can't, I can't do that, but my publisher can do that easily. Cause that's, that's their business model, right? That's yeah. How they that's the wheelhouse, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Plus um, I guess I even tried to reach out to bookstores locally here with my books and they're like, we go to this vendor and that's what we do. And all I could think is, isn't that kind of what the borders does <laughs> or something? <laughs> yeah. I didn't say that, but it's one of those like, um, what good are you? Yeah. So as far as writing goes, tell me about the publishing and how publishing houses are less than great as selling the eBooks versus the, the tangible books, I should say. So in most people uh, don't read, most people haven't read a book since high school. Mm -hmm. So, but if you actually do a random sampling of people just in general mm -hmm. and you ask them if they read, even with the pandemic and what's happened in the last year, most people still have never read an ebook. When oh. they think of book, they think of print. Sure. Publishers have been in this industry for a long, long time. They mm -hmm. have invested millions of dollars, the big ones, obviously, or, or, or uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, the smaller ones, in warehousing where they print mm -hmm. offset printing, where they print. So for example, I think my, my, my publisher done during the, the, the smallest print run they do is a thousand copies. All right. Uh, which is kind of cool. Cause I've actually had, uh, and again, in Canada, you know, most books sell less than a hundred copies. Canada is a much smaller country than the U S. All right. Yeah. So with Dunder and what's really cool is when it goes into a second print run, like it's only a thousand copies. So they printed another thousand, but it's kind of cool because on the on the copyright page you see, you know, the numbers is a one, two, three, four, five to ten. Yeah. You ever open that up and you actually see one, blah, blah, blah. That means it's the first print run. If you see there's no one and it's just two is the first number, then it's the second print run. So these are some of the things I've learned about the industry. All right. Um, so they do a really good job of I, I, they're in the business of shipping dead trees around. That's kind of what their business is, right? Mm -hmm. And they're really, really good at it. They have buyers uh, or sales reps that meet with buyers. And I used to, when I was a, when I was a bookstore manager, I'd have sales rep, reps come into my store and show me catalogs and say, you should buy this, you should buy this. And then, and then if it doesn't sell, I return it and I get a credit and then I can buy more things. Mm -hmm. That's the way the book industry works. And publishers are really, really good at navigating this old boys club, which is mm -hmm. still an old boys club. It is primarily <laughs> middle-aged men in tweed jackets with patches on their, right? <laughs> um, uh, get patting each other on the back. That's, that's kind of the publishing industry in, in a nutshell. But they're really, really good at print books, but they don't understand eBooks because they think eBooks are cannibalizing print book sales. They don't realize it's a different customer. They don't re realize the convenience uh, of eBooks. And so the eBooks are often overpriced and, uh, and they never really know how to push them. So for example, Dundurn, my publisher, love them. They're great to work with. I've got six mm -hmm. books with them. My, my print books sell for $25 Canadian, which would probably be 1999 American, right? Based on the exchange rate. Mm -hmm. Well, I make 8% every time they sell a book. So I get $2, $2 every time they sell a book roughly, right? Okay. I get it a year later. So we're in May, 2021. I haven't received my royalty statement and my single annual check from Dundurn yet for 2020 sales. All right. So I get a, I get a statement in the mail that says you sold this many books. This is how many returned. Uh, if I had an, well, an advance. So I, I get paid in advance. Let's say it's a thousand dollar advance. 
small advance, but decent enough. Right. I have to sell, they have to sell 500 copies of the book before I start earning royalties because that's called earning out your advance. Mm -hmm. And most books published never earn out their advance. So when, when, when a publisher offers me a low advance, I actually see it as cool. I'm going to earn this out. No problem. And most of the time with Thunder and I'd earn out my advance in the first month, right? Because it was such a small advance. Nice. But what it meant, what it meant is they made money. All right. They'll keep publishing my books. And mm -hmm. if, so, so that's kind of an important thing. So that $25 book sells, I get 8%. The, they sell the ebook for $12 or $14, which is ridiculously overpriced. And I still get 8%. Honestly, I think James, in the time we've been talking, I've sold more ebooks while we were talking than they'll sell in a year of mine. Wow. All right. I'm not good at selling ebooks. Right. right. I, 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 it's, you know, it's just, it's pathetic. But when I sell an ebook for $5, I keep 70% of that and I get paid 45 days later. Mm -hmm. directly in my bank account from Amazon, from Kobo, from draft to digital, from all these places. Right. And so I understand that I can go and run a, a, a book bub promo or something. I can temporarily drop my price, which is normally four ninety nine us. I can drop to 99 cents. I, I book a promo deal where I pay a few hundred dollars for it. And suddenly I'm going to sell a thousand copies. My ranking's going to go up. Other people are going to buy it on Amazon or other bookstores yeah, so even though I only make 35 cents on that 99 cent book because the, the, the margin lowers at that price, yeah. I can do stuff like that. And publishers tend not to very well. Mm -hmm. And so I, if I had my way, I would only ever sign print book rights to a publisher and keep ebook rights. And I've tried numerous times, but I'm not a big enough author, big enough name. If Stephen King said, hey, I'm only going to give you print book rights, the publisher goes, yeah, okay, we'll still make a billion dollars on this. Yeah, right. We're good. Um, and so there are publishers, uh, there are some authors who, who can get that sort of deal. But if but in, in, in an ideal situation, I would keep the audiobook rights and the ebook rights because I can, I can sell them better than the publisher can because I can do dynamic marketing and pricing. Mm -hmm. Whereas they're just going to want to set a price and walk away. Yeah, yeah, so... Interesting. So world. now when you write a book, how do you choose if you're going to self-publish it or go with a publisher? Well, uh, I often look at the market and I think about, you know, when you write the book, I think about who are the readers and how are they going to read this? Now, if it's a nonfiction book of ghost stories and the paranormal, mm -hmm. which Dundurn has done a lot of those for me, those are souvenirs. For some reason, people want those books. They want a hard copy of it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and because they're regionalized, I've got books in Ottawa and Montreal and, and uh, Hamilton and Sudbury. Some of them are not regionalized. They're like haunted bookstores or haunted libraries, which is hilarious. I was in, I was in Vegas a couple of years ago, we walked into a Barnes and Noble and I always shop in those sections because I'm looking for research mm -hmm. for more haunted places. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out some haunted Vegas things. And I go to the, the paranormal section and I go, oh my God, they have two copies of haunted hospitals. <laughs> So it's, it's kind of cool when you can walk into a bookstore, uh, you know, in, in the U.S. And the same thing in Florida. I've walked in and found my, uh, you know, Tomes of Terror on the shelves. And I'm like, woo, cool. That's, That's awesome. So cool. Can I sign these? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, because I usually introduce myself to the staff and say, hey, I'm the author of this book. Would you mind if I sign this? They usually ask for ID, right? Just like, <laughs> just sign. I'm Jerry Seinfeld. I'll sign this Random book. guy. <laughs> I got a marker. <laughs> but the cool thing is, is usually... Um, usually when you, if you have a professional interaction and you're friendly and personable and you, you know, you don't, you're not a jerk mm -hmm. and you're kind and generous and you, and you talk to them and you're nice, you've just given an anecdote that that bookseller can use to sell your book. Cause I was yeah. a bookseller, right? Uh, if I had two books and someone came into my store and I met the author uh, of this thriller and there's another thriller and they're both really good thrillers, but I met the author because they were in my store last week and I said, Oh my God, I wrote this story at my grandma's cottage and it was inspired by this crate I found under the whatever. And I imagined what would happen if, so someone comes into my store and is like, well, I'm looking for a good thriller. And I see the two that are really good. That's ideal for them. And I go, well, let me tell you a story. So, you know, this author was in my store last week and she shared this tale with me. Suddenly, Mm -hmm. more likely to sell the book of the author I met who is nice and kind and personable. Um, Absolutely. So that was, I mean, I, I did, a, I did a book signing once um, in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia and uh, nobody showed up. No, not a single customer came. I was there with my book of haunted bookstores and libraries and publish, publisher had set up the tour and I was in town anyway. So I did the thing 
and and I could have been miserable and the mm-hmm. staff felt so bad and I was like don't feel bad you guys can't control this I think it was a, it was a weeknight or whatever that there's a no traffic came into this like some customers came in but nobody came to see me but I spent two hours with the staff chatted them up had a good time uh, I actually uh, I had uh, books of my own that I gave them and I said like here have like I wanted them to leave with a positive experience not this was a grumpy Gus who was all upset that nobody came to his book signing mm-hmm. do they remember that crabby guy or do they remember the guy with the skeleton who was funny right <laughs> had a good time with them. I even helped customers recommend some books because we talked ch- ch- about talk because I was a bookseller. Mm-hmm. Right. So I talked about my favorite books and um, I'm hoping to this day, they remember. And if anyone goes, Oh, I'm looking for whatever. It's like, Oh, there's this guy came into our store. Well, we don't carry the book because never sold. We don't carry the book, but you can, you know, this guy is really cool. And, and like, I don't know. I, I, right. I'm in it for the long term. Uh, it doesn't hurt. I guess is the end. Right never gonna hurt yeah like it doesn't just because you're nice doesn't necessarily mean you'll sell books but it certainly will mean that you didn't do any damage to your reputation yeah otherwise just yeah I'll be tell nice. you, uh, author would come into my store and they would take a book off the shelf and they would go like this and they would face it in front of four other books when it came time to return because bookstores uh, you know return books all the time and you, usually based on lack of sales you need to always find room on your shelves to get rid mm-hmm. of stuff so anytime an author would come in and be a jerk to my staff or me or do something like that and move books around the store just to try and like get their books at eye level or on a different shelf that would be out of alphabetical order so we couldn't find it or mm. would be blocking other people's books. Guess what book gets returned first? <laughs> Playing the game. I love it. Yeah. It's like, no, you were annoying. Why am I going to help you? But this other right. author, well, I'll help them. Like, oh, like I'd be running a return report and I'd look at the same book and go, well, I got to send one of these back to the publisher to get a credit. Well, she was really nice. I'm going to keep her book in the store. Mm-hmm. You, you, like people make decisions based on uh, feeling. Uh, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah, totally. Arguably to a fault. But that's human nature. That's just, yeah. That's why we all make different decisions. <laughs> exactly. It's part of the coolness. So Mark, how can people find you? Uh, you can find out uh, everything you need to know and more or don't want to know about me at marklesley.ca. .ca and CA for Canada. That's right. You and I have an event coming up in uh, August, I want to say, right? At the When Words Collide? Yeah, yeah. Can you conference. tell the audience just really quick about that? Yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, author boot camp. So we have an event. So the free uh, event as part of the conference, which is just an overview of a combination of your business smarts and savvy and my understanding of the book industry to really help authors understand the business of being an author. Mm-hmm. Then we have a full day workshop, which uh, is $50. And that is on August 16th, uh, 2021. And we have uh, the full day workshop, which is author bootcamp basic training, where we are going to give them because here's the thing is I have all these cool ideas, but I don't really have the implementation. You've got these really awesome checklists and calls to action and flow charts and step by step. And so I think when we put us together, Mm -hmm. I think that can really help authors understand uh, the business of writing and publishing but the business of, of, of being an entrepreneur and being a business professional. Mm-hmm. And I think they can walk away from that empowered to know what they need to do for their own path to success. Cause it's going to be unique for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm excited about that. Yeah, and it's, it's remote now because well, yeah. a lot of stuff is still remote. So it's supposed to be in person, but Hey, we'll, 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 we'll roll with it. Right. Yeah. Right. You just adapt. And uh, that makes it available to people worldwide without the plane ticket. So there's an advantage there. Yeah. It's super cool. True. Mark, I want to thank you for being on the show. I had no idea that you had that much experience. No, thank you. I should say just so the audience knows Mark and I have been meeting, I don't know, every week, couple weeks, something like that uh, with another author as well, just to try to put this whole thing together. And Mark, you're super cool, very smart guy, especially in the author world. I had no idea that you had that experience from the bookseller point of view. Oh, really? yeah, I guess because it never really came up, right? No, I never asked for people's <laughs> resume or anything like that. So it's just one of those things that I can tell from the jobs that I, I've had previously. You know, everything builds upon your knowledge and experience. It's all good. Yeah. You in the bookselling world, there are probably not many authors that can say that they 
worked in bookstores, let alone worked in helping purchasing, helping get Kobo set up, which is a huge undertaking, draft to digital set up, another huge undertaking. That's experience that you can't buy. No, no, I tried That's... to buy it, but I couldn't. I had to do it. Yeah. <laughs> and you got paid. You got a little nuts. That's cool. <laughs> That's awesome. So, Mark, thank you so much for being on the show. This is a blast. Oh, thank you, James. It's always fun. Yeah. Tell me one more time. What is the website people can find you at? MarkLeslie.ca. Awesome. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. We are underwritten locally by the Bank of Sun Prairie. If you're listening to this on the web, please give a thumbs up, subscribe, and of course, share it with all your entrepreneurial and author friends. My name is James Kademan and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call, offering call answering and receptionist services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com, as well as Draw in Customers Business Coaching, offering business coaching services for entrepreneurs looking for growth on the web at drawincustomers.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur in all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guest, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, author to help authors and founder of Stark Publishing. Mark, I'm going to ask you one more time for that website just to drill it in people's heads. It's marklesley.ca. Thanks, James. Awesome. <laughs> you just got to remember that CA. <laughs> Past episodes can be found morning, noon, and night at the podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. Thank you for listening. We will see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. And if you do nothing else, enjoy your business. And I should also add, write and publish your book. Thank you.